Hi there. Um, it's Jonathan Herbs again, founder and CEO of Scale Up Growth. Welcome to my business focus series, where I chat with owners, managing directors, founders, and business leaders about scaling their companies. We talk about their entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial journey so far and their aspirations for the company. Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cough today, so I'm, I'm a bit hoarse. But um, it's my great pleasure today to um, introduce Sharon No. Is that how I pronounce your surname? Yes, it is. Hi, Sharon No. That is founder and CEO of ProSpend. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, you pronounce it. it. It's actually just a very short surname, but it's amazing the different combinations I get with it. So You can imagine what I get. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Sharon, with my call, I'm going to let you do all the talking. So, tell okay. me, what is ProSpend? What do you do and, and how long have you been doing it for? Thank you. Uh, so, ProSpend uh, has the... Uh, the name spend in it and pro so we are a business spend management platform um and so what does that mean well that means that we digitize and automate all of the spend processes that businesses have so think credit card spend out of pocket employee expenses paying supplier invoices creating purchase orders managing budgets so all of those um usually manual and quite tiresome inefficient processes can all now be uh, digitized i.e no paper um and uh and um and automated so uh so it's a a, a complete uh, sort of automated platform and making um you know that paper free uh and we do that with a range of technology like um and we we call our platform uh, hyper automation which is a bit of a, maybe it sounds a bit like a buzzword, but it just means that we're combining a whole bunch of technology uh, that allows us to do that. Things like OCR, optical character recognition, AI, ML, RPA, robotic process automation, and uh, and human in the loop. Um, so that in in a nutshell is what the, the, uh, the platform does. Okay. Tell me what, how would it work for me and my business? Just to... Give any, can you give a live an example? Yeah. So uh, typically, well, typically our our customers are uh, mid-sized companies, mid to bigger businesses, and they might have, say, for instance, you know, fifty, a hundred employees running around with credit cards, spending money on behalf of the company, or they might be paying for expenses out of their pockets. So once they've done that, and then the credit card statement comes in, that has to be reconciled and then approved. And in the bad old days, a paper statement would come in and, you know, they'd write on that paper statement. They'd have a, you know, a tedious paper receipt. And then that piece of paper with all its receipts would work its way through to the approver. And then the approver would look at it, maybe bounce it back to, uh, you know, to the person that spent the money. And then eventually that piece of paper, and we're talking not just one statement, but say a couple of hundred, would land in the accounts payable, you know, desk. And that poor person of accounts payable would have to look at it, reconcile it, and key all that data into their finance system. So you can imagine the time that that would take. So what we do is we literally suck in the credit card data feed um, into our platform. Our users have a mobile app. They take a photo of the receipt. We match it. We automate it. It goes through this approval process, which has got lots of rules around it. And then at the end, once it's been approved online by the approver, who can be anywhere, we then suck that data into their finance system. So that that can reduce, you know, the time it takes to process one expense claim, which can take, you know, a couple of weeks down to literally, you know, a couple of hours. So you multiply that by a lot of yeah. people. So that's just one process. The other main process that businesses have, and you would have this, paying suppliers. And the bad old days, it used to always make me laugh, actually. The suppliers would email a PDF invoice, right, to pay. And then what would happen is somebody in accounts payable would then print it out onto a piece of paper. So it actually started digital. It used to go back to paper. And then that piece of paper would work its way around the organization. Again, that would eventually go back to AP and they key in that data. So now what we do is we... Um, bring in the PDF automatically into our platform. We use OCR, so the machine reads it, scans, pulls all the data out, sets it up into our platform as a supplier payment request. We do a lot of the fraud control, so we check the supplier, the ABE, ABN, the bank account details, um, and then it's approved online. And again, that data then just goes straight into the finance system. So it's all of those tedious 
processes that the companies have that we're automating for them. You know, one of the uh, the things I coach even today, because you know, not every company has you have your system, is um, to um, color invoices light blue. <laughs> when it gets printed out, they're all white. So if the invoice yeah. is colored light blue, the account payable person, when you ring up to chase up, can find that invoice really easily. Oh. Really, uh, it look it, really it and all things, right? And you know what, Jonathan? It's madness. And the sixty percent of the mid mid sized businesses in Australia are still doing these. Right. And so, not only is there the huge benefits with you know improving productivity, i.e., you know better bottom line, um, and not having paper, but just employee satisfaction. I mean, I don't think anybody comes into their to their job of a day and says, "Oh, I'm so looking forward to working today because I get to file invoices." You know, no, never. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, and I like your, your fraud control. Um, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, how long has the company been going? So, I actually uh, came up with the idea uh, sort of been around the yeah, two thousand and. Uh, early 2000s when I sort of uh, I was working in the travel industry and I saw the pain points that uh, companies had with people you know spending money on TME travel entertainment um, and then I actually launched the product in 2007 with a beta client Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, wonderful beta client as you can imagine a global client he's still one of our clients today uh, very pleased to say but I actually kept the business quite small for a few years because I had children um, and then when my second one went to school, I decided to really push the business uh, out into the market in a very serious fashion. So that was in 2015-16. So um, sort of had about 20 clients at that time. Uh, and since then, we've now got close to 600 clients. Great. Fabulous. Now, you mentioned um, who, who's your ideal um, ideal client? What? Um, how would you describe them? Yep. So our ideal customer, as I said, our market are the mid-sized businesses. Those the businesses have got a real pain point. You know, lots of employee expenses, lots of supplier invoices. Really tight, trying to keep control of their costs. You know, trying to to be proactive um, about their spend with budgets and and putting in purchase orders. So that's the type of company that that we're really laser focused on. But it's the finance leaders in those businesses. Um, who recognize that, um, you know, they need to be tech savvy. Um, they need to use technology now to make their businesses perform well and to make their employees happy. So, you know, and the role of the CFO has changed dramatically over the years. They're now buyers of technology. They're not just looking at budgets and spreadsheets. Um, and the beauty, beauty about mid-sized businesses is that, um, they're growing, you know, uh, they're growing so, businesses. So inside, how would you quantify the, that in, say, number of staff? I know. It, it's a kind of an elusive sort of, uh, you know, or ambit uh, terminology, but a mid-size, depending on what criteria you look at, if you look at the ATO, they say a turnover of between 10 and 250 million. That's a very big gap. <laughs> yeah. Or if you look at the ATO, uh, the uh, ABS, they say 20 to 200 employees. Um, right. How we classify an ideal, the best customer for us is a company that has, say, about 50 plus people running around with expenses and who are processing about a thousand supplier invoices. And we're really looking at the finance leaders in those companies that, that totally get that automation is going to make a big difference, you know, to the way their company operates. Okay, perfect. So um, you've been through the pandemic, as we all have. Um, some of the actions you took um during the pandemic that have remained with the business going forward? Uh, yes. So the pandemic uh, for us uh, was 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 actually good for us. We were very fortunate to be, to be one of those businesses that did well in the pandemic because it was sort of, you know, if ever a finance leader thought about, um, you know, automating and digitizing the 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 pandemic really uh pushed that forward so uh so so that was good for us so we grew quite fast which meant that we uh you know had to put in a lot more processes uh within our business so we so we as a result we are a lot more process driven uh within the organization uh, but the one thing that is that has been left over from that is hybrid working 
you know, we were all at home, of course, during that time. Uh, and then when we were allowed to go back to work, we decided that we would uh, go with the hybrid approach so that we would allow our people, you know, some flexibility still of being able to work from home. Uh, so we do a three, three day, two day, uh, three days in the office, two days um, at home. And I think that works really well. Um, I think by nature, people do are sociable and they do like to be around their, the people that they work with. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it does make the company feel like there's more of a company culture. You know, the company culture is, is hard to, to keep that momentum when you're all working, you know, remotely. Uh, so, um, so yeah, the work from home, you know, uh, element we've still got running since then. Right. And that seems to be the way, you know, a lot of companies have gone, have gone now giving the, the employees the flexibility to work from home, but bringing them, bring them together for a couple of days a week at least for that collaboration piece. And That's right. Yeah. I think it works really well. Yeah. We, 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 we sort of mandate that. And, and I, you know, it was interesting because uh, there was a few people that, uh, that we have employed since, you know, uh, we've all been back in, in the office and they've actually moved. Uh, they've wanted to move from, from uh, their employee employment because they had retained the, the working remotely and they didn't like that. You know, they wanted to go back into the office. Yeah. And that's, you know, it is interesting because, as you say, we are social social beings. But, you know, giving the uh, that flexibility is, is is so important. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and even just well, that, 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 just getting in the car and drive to the office. Yeah. You know, and then and so you've actually got a distinction between home and the office. Otherwise, if you're working from home all the time, there's no distinction, is there? That's right. Mm. Just running the sofa. Uh, and and they, but um, they'll explain that. They'll explain that later. What one of the things I'm I, I, I'm doing with with these podcasts now is we're about to start um, uh, transcribing them out and sharing um, share it, um, sharing our best practice, yeah, separately and blog series as well. And the uh, the hybrid versus full full time versus fully off is, is one of those those pieces I want to pick up. So yeah. I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ignoring you. Sorry. That's true. Um, so, what does the future look like, and what do you see as the main challenges going forward? Uh, so, we are fortunate that we we're uh, we're quite relevant, uh, you know, um, in the market. You know, uh, smart businesses are you know always looking to control their cross costs and improve efficiencies. Um, so, uh, you know, we are fortunate that we're uh, we are in a you know a growing industry, which is great. Uh, as I alluded before, um, you know, sixty percent of mid-sized businesses, you know, are still not digital or automated. So, so there is still lots of opportunity for us. Um, so, our, our uh, you know, our, our vision for the future, as far as growth, uh, you know, is is good. You know, we're very excited about the future uh, and what that will bring, as well as the fact that there's new technology that we can bring. Um, to uh, to our customers, things like virtual cards, which I have a real passion about. Um, so that's a uh, that's a very exciting new part. Oh, right. Can you explain that to me, please? So virtual cards is the ability for companies to be able to issue a virtual card, a debit card that sits on the employee's wallet, on their phone, or on their smart watch, and it eliminates the need for companies to ask employees to pay for business expenses out of their own pocket and then to have to claim that back. I really have a have a real real uh, passion about that. That is just not something that the company should be asking employees to do. No. You know, especially at the cost of living today, you should not be asking your employees to be using their own funds for business expenses and then to have to wait for that to be claimed back. So by being able to offer a virtual card, you can put one of these cards on your uh, employee's wallet straight away and they've got funds straight away to be able to use the money for, uh, you know, company expenses. And because we're, you know, so techno technologically enabled, we can get a data feed straight away. So the company's got high visibility around it. They've got lots of controls around it as well. But it just means that the employees aren't using their, you know, they're not using their own funds. Um, as well as the, uh, uh, the, we're going into the payment space where our suppliers will be able to pay, our customers will be able to pay their suppliers right out of our platform. So 
you know, we're in a we're in a technology space that is just growing and it's evolving. So that's uh, that is very exciting. On the challenge side, um, skilled staff is is our biggest challenge. Um, you know, we are in a you know a sort of a, a niche uh, area in where sort of combining, you know, people needing to know technology as well as finance. Uh, so you know, that's a skill set that you know not everybody has. Um, so particularly in um, in our implementation support staff, you know, we look for those sort of um, those backgrounds. So you know that there's not a lot of people that have got those backgrounds so that would probably be our biggest challenge at the moment is finding the right people okay so we uh, you know sorry the question without notice um given that i'm deep diving into ai at the moment the chat gpt is in the like are you using um artificial intelligence actively yes we do we uh, we have a process where uh, as I said, you know, a supplier invoice will come in or a receipt will come in and we will scan that. So we'll use OCR uh, and then, um, you know, the machine has got to, you know, pull that data out um, and uh, and then we will populate that into the platform. If the machine doesn't read the information in the first hit and, you know, sometimes it doesn't, you know, OCR is certainly not, you know, foolproof. Mm -hmm then um, we will actually then teach the machine with machine learning. And so we're quite unique in the market in that um, that um, invoice will then fail over to what we call as a human in the loop team. So they're actually humans that are eyeballing, you know, that invoice and, and the data that's come out. And if it isn't correct, they will then do a drag and drop to teach the machine so that um, it will remember that. And so through that loop and then, you know, with the intuitive AI program, um, you know, it, over time, the next time that invoice comes in, the machine should have learned it. It should have had enough intelligence to know, oh, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm meant to go there and I'll pick this information up. So, yeah, we do use um, AI within our business. Uh, okay. I just thought, you know, the nine questions I ask, I really should throw that in as a 10th question. Yeah, you know, it's so tropical now and, and so recent, you know, since, since it's really boomed in early, early December. Yeah, but, you know, AI is only as good as as, uh, as being taught too, you know. Excellent. I mean, so, you know, you do have to have, it has to be taught. It's, and it has to have huge data sets as well to uh, to start to to recognise its errors. So um, it's it's not the be-all and end-all. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, and it's, it's fascinating how, you know, where all my learning is going is, you know, how do I, um, use AI to you know, to to speed the um, my client learning and 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 to yeah you know, to speed and enhance their 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 experience from the the, the learning experience. Um, um, so, what do you think has been your biggest learning since you uh, since you've been a business owner? Um, so, I guess um, I think I mean I. I the the company was bootstrapped and still is bootstrapped today. We we've not taken any VC money, um, so we've grown it, um, you know, on our own strength, um, which meant that I, uh, you know, had to do it all at one point, you know, in the business. You know, it was me, um, so I just did everything in the business. Um, as the business has grown, obviously we've had more people come in. Um, that is, so I have been able to do, you know, less hands on. But I think uh, I wish I had have made um, more of an effort to uh, work on the business um, and not in the business earlier, um, you know, making a more concerted effort to, uh, to schedule in time for connecting with people, um, I think has been uh, something that I've learned, you know, is incredibly valuable um, to do that, you know, to, uh, to connect up with people um, and, and leverage, you know, their experience, which is why I love these podcasts, because I think, you know, if somebody said to me, you know, 10 years ago, you know, you need to go out and get a mentor, um, then, uh, you know, I probably would have done that earlier. I mean, I did find a mentor and I did end up joining a networking group, um, a group called Head Over Heels, which is a, a group for, um, for women led tech companies. I think so I, that I, I, are, you still, are you still a member? Yes, I am. I think I've interviewed. Seven members from Head Over Hill. Yeah, it's a fabulous organisation, and um, yeah, you know, women entrepreneurs. But some of the the women I've interviewed are phenomenal. Absolutely, and, so, and that was a real game changer for me. And I wish I had reached out earlier 
um, you know, to understand uh, the power of being able to um, not just connect up with people for connections, but also just to leverage, you know, their advice as well. Yep. Um, so yeah, that that I think is probably one of the main learning curves that I that I've had. Um, that you can't do this completely on your own. Yeah, well, you know, I appreciate that being being a CEO coach. Um, but uh, I have the room, and it's um, Mike it was fascinating. I was um, I have a very well known brand yesterday. Um, I spoke to their their, um, their thirty senior leaders um, for a couple of hours on. Um, you know, at, on you know, business growth and and how to make the business you know, more remarkable and the leaders more remarkable than they are now. And um, yeah, and one of the things the CEO said to the um, to the team, you know, the, the it's bringing in people with you know, additional knowledge to, to to help and mentor and advise and coach, yeah. which have made the difference, you know, for that bit in that business. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think it's probably, I guess the reason why the Head Over Heels is so successful is for for, for women particularly. Um, you know, we often take time away from business to have children. And then when we get to go back, which is exactly what I did, you know, I kept the business very small for a period of time. And then when I went back into the business, you know, I was sort of, um, you know, I had lost a lot of my contacts in those so those years. Um, and, uh, and, and they are important, um, uh, to, to grow the business. Definitely. And it's interesting with the head of the hills, you know, I, I, um, I found them because we, I interviewed very early on a, oh, I've forgotten the name. I'm sorry. Uh, Cause we've done 70 plus of these now, but, yes. um, and she was a member of head of the hills and I reached out cause it's very hard to find, um, uh, women found us and women yeah, who have really scarred businesses. And so I reached out to Head Over Hills and I think, as I said, I think I've done six or seven interviews yeah. um, with CEOs from it and they've all spoken very, very, um, uh, very, very positively. And yeah. uh, and they've all, all scarred their businesses significantly, um, a, a lot of it due to the support they've got from Head Over Hills. Yeah. Can I just share a story with you about, you know, one of the significant changes I had from Head Over Hills um, uh, I mean, the format just for your listeners are that you know you you are uh, you are uh, you know interviewed and and uh, and then you are allowed to become a portfolio uh, company, um, and so you are you know you need, you do need to sort of be at that at that point where you're wanting to scale as well, um, and then you get the opportunity to present your business to a room of people, and so the the head over heels is not just about you know sort of uh, you know, networking with other women, it's being able to be introduced to a whole bunch of these, what they call connectors. And these people are, you know, C-suite executives, um, you know, people that are, that are, uh, that have run their own businesses, BCs, it's backed by Macquarie Bank, EY, you know, so really- you know, just, you know, quick, the people, the connectors are, um, men and women. It's not only, yeah. it's not a, That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so the opportunity that you have is that you present, you do a pitch to the to the room, and it's usually a couple of hundred people in the room. And at the end of the pitch, you ask for connections. So you're actually asking to be introduced to people that you know will really make a difference to your business. And so my biggest ask was to be introduced to MYOB. So we had decided that we needed to do an API integration to to the ERP systems. The natural choice for us was going to be with MYB Advanced because they had the lion's share of the mid market. So, you know, you can't just pick up the phone and, and just you know ring MYB. You need to be introduced to somebody. Mm -hmm. So that was my biggest ask. It was to be introduced to somebody at MYB, and then they split you into these huddles, and you go into these four different rooms, and uh, and there's about twenty five people in each room, and and then you repeat your ask, and then the people in the room they put up their hand and say, I'll introduce you to this person. I'll introduce you to that person. It's very serious. It's There's a scribe there and they write down your name if you're going to introduce it, who you're going to introduce them to. And then, you, then, you know, that has to be followed through. So it's not just a, a lame, oh, you know, look, I'll take your business card and think about it later. You know, it's a very serious process. So with my first huddle, I had an introduction from Naomi Simpson, um, you know, ex Shark Tank and Redwood. And she said to me, Sharon, I want to introduce you to Tim Reed, who was then the current CEO of MYOB. And I just went, Oh my God, I'm going to go home now because that was my biggest ask. And I have been introduced. 
And sure enough, that night she sent an email off to Tim Reed at NYIB. Tim Reed emailed her back and said, I'll put her in touch with these people in the, in, in the business. He introduced me and they just took us under their wing and, uh, and introduced us to, uh, to all of their channel, um, their channel partners. And then for the next year and a half, two years, you know, 50% of our incoming business was coming in through NYIB. So it was an absolute game changer. Is that a lot? One, one connection. Yeah. And it's interesting, Naomi Simpson, you know, I, I started this, um, the CEO business coaching, um, as a sort of like scouting up coach and Naomi Sim Simpson, um, a lot of her early, um, uh, success she ascribes to the lessons she learned from, from the scaling up network. And I said to this day, I believe yesterday, I was using pictures of some of her early, um, early, um, dashboards. Um, as examples of, of how to um, scale your business using dashboards. So it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a yeah. small, small world. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, next question. So when you think of the word successful, who pops to mind and why? This was a very easy question for me to answer. Um, I have or had, very unfortunately, um, my brother, my oldest brother, um, who's passed away just very recently, um, from leukemia, which was very sad, but he was a twice over successful, um, tech entrepreneur at the Silicon Valley, he spent a lot of time over there. Um, so he was an incredibly successful person, not just in business, but also the way that he approached life and the way that he thought things through and the way he valued, um, you know, other people, um, he took up Buddhism um, sort of fairly late in life. And so he had a really wonderful wisdom and a way of approaching life and dealing with other people. Um, so um, he actually helped me a great deal in, in this business. I, I lived on him a lot, obviously, uh, with his experience, but it wasn't just the business experience. It was also just, you know, how to deal with people and uh, uh, and how to approach life in the best possible way. So uh He's definitely the most successful person I've ever met and probably will never meet in my life. Um, did he have a family? Yes. Yes, he had a family. Make sure you share the video with him. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I will. Yeah. Yeah, so, wonderful man. I mean, in fact, uh, at his funeral just recently, uh, it was live streamed to... Um, he he came back to Australia and did a uh, a life change and and uh, went to the Hunter Valley and and you know uh, bought a vineyard and a winery and a restaurant and and uh, he met a lot of people there and changed the lives of a lot of people there. But also it was live streamed to a lot of people in the Silicon Valley. So yeah, he touched a lot of people in his life. Yeah, lovely story. And I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. Thank you. Um. So you mentioned you, that you um, listen to podcasts, um, books, business auto, autobiographies, podcasts, a couple you might recommend? Um, I do listen to a lot of podcasts these days. I am actually, I love to read, but I don't read anywhere near as much as I be used to, that's for sure. Um, but um, I always love the, the book um, Shoe Dog by uh, Phil Knight. That's a brilliant book. Uh, so, uh, so that's a favourite of mine. I'm at the moment reading Measure What Measure What Matters by John Donner. Yeah. So we're just introducing into the business here the whole OKR um, format, you know, objectives and key results. Um, the minute I picked that book up, it was like an aha moment to me. Oh, we should have been doing this years ago. Uh, so, uh, so that's a, a book that I'm reading um, at the moment. Um, and yeah, I just sort of, you know, browse all sorts of different podcasts as well, just to, to glean, um, you know, some learnings from, from, and, and it might be a podcast on uh, marketing or uh, on sales or, you know, any sorts of different, different podcasts I listen to. Um, there's a podcast called, um, by Guy Reyes called How I Built This. Well, uh, for you, it would be well worth listening to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Interviews with founders, how I build them, how they build their businesses, mm -hmm. uh, and they're short form as well. It's a really good one. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's interesting on OKR. So um, OKRs and KPIs, you know, they can be changeable. I think that they complement each other. Mm -hmm. um, now I mentioned um, AI um, earlier. Excuse me. Okay. Um, at a um, a coaching session, I did a two day coaching session with um, 
the CEO and a founder and leadership, leadership team of one of my clients recently. And as an experiment, well, I, was, I, I introduced like ARs to them. So it was a whole new thing for them. And in the second, second day, second half of the day is when we nail down the quarterly, you know, what we got to do for the quarterly spread. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we got all the ideas and as part of introducing AI to the world, I took the, you know, the, the, um, what they put on, on all the boards around the room, fed it to chat GPT and asked chat GPT to write an OKR on each of the areas. So sales, marketing, manufacturing, et cetera. Right. Uh, what one of the you know, the key okay the three OKRs for each of those areas for the next um for the next quarter? It was extraordinary what it came out with. Is that right? Would be you know you sit there and you know you spend half a day trying to look out what the OKR is for for the next quarter or the next three years. This thing in the space of you know thirty seconds, yeah, okay. a ninety percent solution. And you know AI is not about replacing replace this, but it's actually about making it easy for us. It was phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, how how far it got them in a very, very short time, yeah. then mold, mold themselves up to that final 10%. So yeah. worth, worth thinking about if you're doing that. Yeah. I mean, I mean you take, to spend 20 minutes on on um, on a separate call and show you how, how how we did it. Yeah, no, that would be great. I'd really enjoy that. Look, I, I mean, I, I, I love technology. I mean, I've always been, you know, a bit of a nerd about technology, you know, you know, right back from my days in travel uh, when we were still using these, these paper books airline schedules that i literally were printed and sent yep. all the way around the world uh and i can remember you know vividly the day that the computer system wow. you know the gds computer system turned up on my desk and all of a sudden i could just you know type in there and i can get back the answers within you know seconds as soon as we so uh you know for me technology is uh it's not something to be scared of i know everybody is very worried about you know chat gpt and ai but it you know it's not it, you don't need to be scared of it it can just make such an impact to uh to to uh, to the way we work and making it so much more enjoyable and quicker and less tedious and and, and easier yeah easier around yeah. i mean you said that like everything else garbage in garbage out so yeah, it's right exactly yeah that's right yeah. um so my last question any last piece of advice or parting words um for entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs out there Yes, um, I think uh, surround yourself by people who also believe in your vision and your values, I think is uh, so critically important, particularly, um, you know, people that, um, you know, have a stake in the business. We're just introducing um, an ESS into the business um, and uh, and that's uh, great because you know, we've actually had people more recently knocking on on my door saying, "I want to come and work for you," uh, because I believe in that vision and that value. Um, so, you know, if you can surround yourself, um, you know, by by people who have that same approach to the way they work um, and believe in what you believe in, then you know, having a good, a good team of people, um, you know, is just the power really of, of your business, isn't it? Um, I mean, I always love the quote that Steve Jobs had to, you know, um, hire people that are smarter than you, you know, <laughs> definitely because, you know, not all of us are great at everything. Um, so you need to be looking for people that are smarter than you, um, and leveraging off their, their skills. Um, and I suppose the only other second, um, sort of you know, main piece of advice I would say to anybody, you know, looking to start a business, go in with what eyes wide open. Um, you know, be ready for years of hard work and sacrifice. Um, and uh, and if you you haven't chosen something that you truly believe in and have a passion for, then you just will not succeed because it's just, as we all know, it's just not an overnight success. Yeah, well, I was quoting yesterday. Um, what, another one of those Steve Jobs. You know, um, amazing how um, how long it takes for an overnight success. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, you know, Apple took 25 years before you know, it sort of went like that, and sort of after 25, it was only 25 years on that it that it, it did that. That's right, exactly. Mm-hmm. And and I think um, you know the media makes so much hype now about um, entrepreneurs, and there's so much um, you know uh, you know media focus on you know these companies that get a lot of VC money, and you know how quickly they're growing, and and, but that's such a tiny, tiny proportion of people that actually start businesses. 
Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's just a long slog. It's it's a long, hard slog. Um, and, um, you know, you just got to be prepared to, to make those sacrifices until you do become an overnight success. It's actually right. It's actually right. Um, Sharon, is there any sp- uh, specific um, thing you'd like to, uh, um, we haven't spoken about this, um, you know, how could you, how do we introduce you to, you know, clients on my podcast, my 11, you know, 7,000 LinkedIn uh, followers, um, what's the best way for them to get in, in, in contact with you and, and what's the, yeah, what's the best approach? Uh, well, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and in fact, uh, my, yeah, my mobile number is even up there on LinkedIn. Um, so, <laughs> uh, which, which sometimes to my detriment because I do get some dodgy calls, uh, but, uh, no, more than happy to, uh, to, you know, to, uh, to speak to anybody if it's about, um, you know, what they can learn from me, or uh, I'm always interested to speak to other technology people, you know, how we can work together. And certainly we'll be happy to speak to any clients about how we can make their their right. business processes better. Uh, we obviously have a website as well. Um, I'll, I'll share, of course, I'll, I'll share all of that in the um, uh, in the show notes and, and, and the slides to get to the, the start and finish. But, um, uh, thank you. No, and no, thank you. So, fabulous conversation as always. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Jonathan. Really appreciate the the uh, the introduction and um, all the best. And 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 yeah, I would like to follow up with you uh, with that office. Yep. So that would be great. Yeah, very very happy to. And that applies to anybody anybody out there. It's um, it's uh, life changing what's going on at the moment with with AI and and business changing. Yeah. So thank you again, Sharon. No worries. Thanks very much.